All right. Happy uh, almost Father's Day. I'm Ed O'Keefe, uh, White House political correspondent for CBS News. Not at the White House today, uh, but a rare work from home day. So rare, in fact, you may hear a dog barking in the background. Sorry about that. But we're excited to have this conversation about Father's Day, about being working dads, about dads who uh, have demanding jobs uh, that sometimes eats into fatherhood um, or makes fatherhood more interesting, depending on how you look at it. And uh, I am psyched to be joined by a handful of colleagues who are all over the country today. Uh, Vladimir Dutier, of course, you know from CBS Mornings and the CBS News Streaming Network, who's up in New York. Scott McFarland, uh, who covers Congress and a lot of other issues uh, for us here in the D.C. area. And then Omar Villafranca, who right now is literally parked but on the road <laughs> on assignment in Oklahoma, covering some nasty weather out that way. Guys, thank you so much. And again, if you hear the dog, my third <laughs> child, um, it is just a reality of being at home. Suddenly she got very excited and now wants to weigh in. Um, I, I, part of what we're talking about, obviously, is being fathers. So we'll probably lay our cards on the table here. Uh, father of a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. Uh, incredibly uh, unique ages, for sure. You can see the changes quite dramatically. I think of all of us, though, Scott, you probably have the oldest children, so we probably should go in order of seniority here uh, nice. and start with you. Yeah, I got a 9-year-old and a 12-year-old who are days away from becoming 10-year-old and 13-year-old. And I just, speaking on behalf of the four of us, we represent some subset of the American population in several different professions who have to have this one reality. We can't always tell our kids when we're going to get home at night. We can't always yeah. tell our kids where we're going to be tomorrow or if we're going to be right there on time for the soccer game, the orchestra performance, or the honor society induction. And it's not just journalists. I mean, there's, there's police officers, first responders, hospital workers, people who work on planes, <laughs> flight attendants, mm -hmm. pilots. And that's the challenge to fatherhood that I really wanted to speak to is that we represent a percentage of Americans who have to figure out a scheme to get home at night on time for things involving our kids. And it's a daily stress. It's a daily worry. It's a daily burden. But when we succeed, when we pull it off, it's the biggest joy of the day. Yeah, it is. It sure is. Uh, Omar, I think in, in uh, d descending order, then you're next, right? Yeah, I have a, I'm the dad to a seven-year-old girl, seven going on 17. <laughs> um, and she is, we have, my wife and I have one, one kid and you're right, Scott, it's, you know, they're in activities and with, we always want to be there for them. And it's interesting too, because of course, if our kids want to see us, sometimes they just flip on the TV. And what I love about it is the perspective that, my daughter gives me um, if I'm covering a hurricane or social unrest or, or whatever story, not some good, some not so good. Um, but it, there's that unfiltered question. And my favorite is still after covering a hurricane in new Orleans, it was just dad, it was raining outside. Why were you outside? Which I'm sure I, I know I've asked that question a million times. Uh, but coming from a kid, it, it, it kind of puts it in perspective. And as important as sometimes we think our job can be in the subject we're covering, our kids are very good at basically saying like, hey, your dad first to me. And that to me is the ultimate reset um, on any on everything that we do. And so I love having that perspective. You're right, Scott, to go home and kind of reset and be there, be there for those moments is fantastic. And Vlad, of course, you're the newest member of the club. This is your first Father's Day, right? This is my first Father's Day. Uh, I am uh, the proud father of a four and a half month old. Uh, her name is Celine. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about, Scott and Omar and Ed, is the um, the demands of our job. And one thing that I'm, and again, this is all new for me. I'm learning this because. As you guys know, people will tell you, I mean, I spent an entire nine months on our show, CBS Mornings, 
doing a segment called Vlad to Dad, where you know my co-host Tony and Nate and um, people would come onto the set and give me tips and advice and guidance about what to expect when you are a father, but really nothing can prepare you, as you guys know, for the actual moment. And so what's happened with me is almost every day, especially in this period, is a process of discovery. And I'm a guy, like before uh, I Celine came into our lives, I mean, yeah, getting on a plane, no problem. You need me to go to DC or you need me to go to South Korea, I'm there, bye Mary, and I'll see you when I see you, you know? And there were definitely many days when I was like, because I love to travel and I love to travel for work, especially that, you know, I was looking, I'd look forward to those trips, even if they were, you know, stories that, uh, you know, were around tragic circumstances. Um, but if they were feature stories, I would love it even more. I'm going to Nashville. I'm going to interview Amy Grant and Vince Gill. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, now... I find myself like, oh man, do I really have to go to Kingston, New York, <laughs> which is going to take <laughs> two hours to get to and two hours to get back? Like, I just want to go home and see Celine and see Mary and my wife and hang out with them. And, you know, and I'm already missing things. Like, I missed her first giggle um, because I was in Haiti reporting um, from, from there a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so, it's not a big deal because we have cell phone uh, cameras that can capture every single moment. But I was kind of feeling melancholy when I missed that first giggle. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of preparing myself, not just for where you guys are, which is that your kids are sad when you are not able to be there for their special moments. But this feeling that's kind of new to me of me wanting to, for the first time in my life, not go anywhere and just be close to home and close to my family. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was still in newspapers, one of those first times I had to leave. Uh, and in fact, I might've been coming up to do something for CBS and uh, my oldest was old enough now that she was talking. And for the first time from the bath, looking up at me as I was leaving to leave, she said something like, I'll miss you. Yeah. And to this day, I'll never forget it. And I turned around and looked at my wife and I burst into tears because I was like, I had never yeah. contemplated that feeling or that separation before in life. And it was just such a galling thing that continues to this day in different ways. They don't claim to miss you or they're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. they do, but they, they channel it differently now. But it was one of those etched in my memory moments that I'll never, ever forget. And Scott, I know we've, we've you, you, it's funny that you started the way it did, because I know you talk about this a great deal, the sort of the push and pull of it, and the concern about um, saying yes to so much, but knowing it's going to potentially blend into all those other things. Um, and, and the power of saying no, I think, sometimes is something that's hard for a lot of us in this business, because, you know, we, we want to be working, we want to be on, we want to be in the thick of it. Yeah. Um, but it can be a real challenge. For every parent, mothers and fathers, say it's 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 mutually exclusive. Every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. That's true in the personal life. It's true in the professional life. And you balance it. But every time you say yes to something your kids ask you to do, your spouse asks you to do, or your boss asks you to do, you're saying no to the other group. And when you figure that out, you recognize there's not always a virtue to saying yes to everyone at every point. And one thing that strikes me is, as foundationally true is if you have to on occasion tell your kids I can't be there for that or I can't do that for you and you see or feel the disappointment you actually should embrace that it's when they're resigned to the fact you're going to say no and no longer care or are disappointed that's when you got a problem and that's how you find the balance if you can still I'm sorry when you do have to say I can't be there for that as long as there's a genuine response of, oh, I was really hoping you'd be there, then you're still in the game. It's when they start resigning themselves to the fact that daddy's never going to be here for this type of thing or that type of thing. That's when you have to change your balance. And yeah. ultimately, that's where I try to find the sweet spot. So long as I've got them still <laughs> in the spot where they, they really do expect daddy to make most things they're involved with. That's true for moms, too. That's true for people in all walks of life. Not saying it's unique to us dads, not saying it's unique to us dads with unique jobs. But I think that's what you have to be measuring for. That's the barometer. I sometimes try to, um, you know, since we, 
it's hard for me to get into a routine because it's, you know, there's a two day and a five day bag packed in my car, ready to go that frequently gets used. When I am home, I try to create a routine with my daughter. Her name is Reese um, to where she knows, like if I'm home, I'll make her breakfast in the morning. Um, always make her breakfast, even if it's just toast or if I'm cereal or she loves fruit salads, I'll make fresh fruit salads for her. So she knows and she associates that. And I was, you know, reading a bunch of books, you know, b- before she was born to try to think, get ready for things and talking to people and hoping for the little memories like that. And when I'm on the road, it makes me feel better because if I, I'll talk to her, of course, with FaceTime, which helps. And she'll be like, "Ugh, mom made me toast, dad. It wasn't as good as your, you know, your fruit bowl that you make me in the morning. And she's missing the fruit bowl. But part of me's like, yes, she's <laughs> missing the fruit bowl. You know, you want that little thing. So now, you know, you know, she's had it to where she's gone to bed and she wakes up and I wake her up and I'm saying, hey, I'm going to go downstairs and make your fruit bowl. And her morning is just, that's her cup of coffee. She's up. She's like, oh, this is great. And I think as a dad, as much as, and then a parent period, you want to create those little things like, you, you know, they love their parents equally, but dad makes the better breakfast. That's a win, I think, for any parent. See, I get the, I, I want mommy. And there's this great meme <laughs> on Instagram that's, that, that said that, you know, when kids say, I want mom, it's the equivalent of saying, could I please speak to management? <laughs> <laughs> um, so especially with the four-year-old now, it's, I want mommy, I want mommy. I say, well, what did I do wrong? Could you please tell yeah. me to do the job better, right? Yeah. No, nope, just wants to talk to mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get that vibe very soon. It starts yes. at younger age. Um, we are all, of course, here because we, at some point, uh, I guess presumably had a father. Um, is there any advice from either your dad or your stepdad or your grandparent uh, that sort of rings true now or or some sort of example? they I, To me, it's more of the example that they somehow said. I called mine the other night as mine were running around at bath time and just said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because if I was half as wild as they are right now, I don't know how you held it together every night. My, my um, father... Um... Uh, my, my father, uh, this 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 hangs on me every single day. My father passed one month before my oldest son was born, so we missed by just a few weeks. My my chance for my dad to meet my oldest son and to be a grandpa, and <laughs> that's something that hits me every day that we never had that opportunity. Um, some of the lessons he taught me, and maybe it was a a paternalistic role versus a maternal role, are things I actually find more practical now that I'm, um, I've got older kids. I don't know. Dad's lessons resonate with me now that I've got a teenager on the way in a few weeks. Um, I, I was always the crummiest athlete on the team. I, I, I mean, always the last kid in the schoolyard pick, always the last kid off the bench, but I always liked playing. So I always played on the team. And my dad told me unequivocally, if you show up to practice on time and you have all your equipment ready, you're going to get some playing time because it's going to help you stand out from your knucklehead teammates. Yeah. If you're just punctual and prepared, you're going to get playing time. And it was so true. I was the coach's favorite because I was there on time. I had my glove ready. I had the right cleats. I had my hat on straight. And that is such a metaphor for how to succeed professionally and how to succeed as a dad. As long as you're there on time and you have all the stuff you need, you will be among your boss's favorites and you will be among <laughs> your kids' idols because you're reliable. And it's a dad lesson that maybe didn't serve you when I had two-year-old, three-year-old, um, or when I had an easier job. Um, but it really serves me well now. I, I One lesson I got from my dad and my mom was um, if you're doing, if you want to do something, don't be afraid to, to fail at it. And, you know, that old, you know, if you, you know, fail once, try, try again. And as a kid, you know, I would get frustrated and, but my parents would be like, it's okay. You know, I'd say, but I'm failing. It's not, it's not working. Keep doing it. You're going to get better. And little did I know they were doing it for two reasons to build confidence, but also to realize that you have to keep going on things. And that's something now I see that lesson with my daughter. She's in gymnastics 
And uh, at seven years old, she's the youngest on her team. I'll brag on her. She's she was born breech, so she was born doing the splits. She has no problem doing that now. So when she's out there flipping around, you know, it's because she practices. And, you know, but when she would fail and get frustrated, I'd be like, it's okay. You know, you're not Simone Biles yet. You're seven or you're six when she was, you know, starting it. And now she's getting really good at it. And she'll she'll look at me and be like, yeah, dad, you're right. You know, I had to practice. And I told this one story to my buddies, like our my dad group at home she went to a gymnastics meet and she kept on getting like second place and third place, which is great, but she won it first. So I told her she didn't get a medal. And this was a league where they don't hand out a trophy to everyone. And I told her, well, this week at practice, you need to practice really hard, focus, listen to your coach and, 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 you know, don't give up. If you fail, keep trying until you get it. Well, the next week I happened to be in town and I got to go to the meet and she started cleaning up. And, you know, part of me is like, yes, this is great. She was listening to the lesson, but then she looked at me and she was like, dad, I really listened to you. And I thought, did I just create Kobe Bryant? Oh my God. Is she going to be the worst teammate ever? You know, you, you wonder about that. You wonder how much they're listening to the lessons that you hope are going to resonate. And when they do, it is, it's a pretty cool feeling. Well, you know, um, I, my, my parents were divorced when I was very young, when I was, you know, five and, um, and uh, I don't have the greatest relationship with my biological father. Um, and my stepfather came into my life when I was uh, about 11 or 12. Um, and, and especially in those early years, he sort of took a, um, I'm not here to sort of interfere or to, you know, I was a very sort of sensitive and, and introverted kid. And a lot of people who, see me on, on television are shocked to believe that. But if you know members of my family, my sister or my mom, they'll tell you how introverted I really am, how I sort of would lose myself in, in the films that I loved or the books that I enjoyed and the music that I listened to and could spend hours if, and, not, and even days um, in that space um, without interacting with, with other people. Um, but what I, and, and that was part of the reason why I was sort of reluctant to have children. I'm almost, I'm 53 and so, and this is my first, um, because I just didn't know that I would, or I just didn't think that I had a, a, a roadmap to follow in the way that uh, some of you have, um, even though my stepfather, but what, what I ended up realizing is in the case of my stepdad, um, he uh, presented an example of what real fathers, in my estimation, are, which are um, men who uh, may not be there to offer that advice uh, when you're in at the Little League game or um, even advice on, you know, girls or how to navigate school um, and, and friends, but um, that is there to provide a roof over your head and, um, uh, you know, a, a, a a meal and and comfort when you need it, um, but not to be intrusive. And I think that that was something that I that I appreciated. Um, and with my biological father, um, and this is something that I'm very cognizant of. You know, um, he, he wasn't in my life all that much after age six, but but the things that I am, those things that I just mentioned, my love of film and my love of of, of books and and music. I can absolutely 100% attribute to him. Um, he, from a very early age, would uh, expose me to literature. Um, I remember specifically the Greek myths and how I was fascinated by, he would, he, at first he would tell me the stories. He would explain why the Greeks believe that here's how the sun is represented by the sun god Apollo. And then when I got to be a certain age, um, he would go out and buy me children's books about uh, the Greek myth. And even after he and my mother separated and he was still sort of in my life, as I got a little older, um, he would bring me books and expose me to interesting um, music. Um, and so even though when we, when we define what a father is, you can define it in many, many, many ways, but I became very aware that exposing a child to things that are interesting can have a profound and lasting effect even into adulthood, even if you never see them again, um, because you latch on to something that is comforting to you and it stays comforting to you for your entire life. And in my case, it was, it was the arts. And so, um, so, so that's sort of, 
and, and my stepdad was the kind of guy who, you know, he, he had always one thing that he would say. He, he didn't really fuss with me and my sister all that much, but he would always say, I have one rule and that's to treat everybody, whether they are, you know, janitors or flight attendants or restaurant servers or delivery men to the CEO, to the president of the United States, you treat everybody with respect. You treat them the way you would want to treat them. That was the only time I ever saw him get mad is when he thought I was being rude one day to a restaurant worker. My, my stepfather never yelled, was the chillest dude ever still is. But the one day that he got mad is when he thought I was being rude to somebody. Um, and that's, that's something that has stayed with me forever. Ed, I, I want to interject. I, I'm wondering, if you reflect your dad, was he also, I'm sorry, funny as hell, really uh, good writer, <laughs> uh, good storyteller? Uh, he's definitely a good writer. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we're all, we're all Irish, so we're very good storytellers. <laughs> um, but he also, I, I remember, I mean, he's the Irish one, my mother's the Guatemalan one, and I remember the movie Stand and Deliver, maybe you guys have seen it yeah. uh, from back in the day. And at some point, when we were really young still, he had me watch it. And um, because if you remember the movie, Edward James Olmos, who plays the teacher, kept telling the kids, you have to have ganas, right? Which yeah. essentially means desire mm. or hunger. And so you always have to have ganas in whatever it is you're doing or you're not going to succeed. And if it's not something you have ganas about, then you probably should be able to look for something else to do. And as long as you have that, he, it was basically it was the argument, you will make it. Um, and I, so every so often, like just the word comes back to me and I can vivid, I can just remember one scene of sitting there watching the movie and I've watched it since, like it was on a plane. I was on a few, like two years ago and I watched it again. And I was just like, you know, at the end of it, like pumping my fist again, being reminded about it. Um, so that, that's, that's certainly one lesson. And then I just think, um, he talked a lot, you know, he's a Wharton grad. And so he was very career focused in addition to being a good father and with life stuff, but he always talked about sort of the, the staircase. It's like, if you're going to do this and then you're going to get to that. And if you want to get up here to like the sixth stair, what does it take to get to that? And so just kind of always have kept that as well in the back of your mind. That, okay. Right now you're doing this. That may be the ultimate goal, but as with everything, it's going to take a little while to climb to that spot. Um, and so it's a sense of patience and, and forward momentum and, and things like that. Um, the, uh, and, but the other funny thing, Vlad, when you said how your dad, exposed you to a lot of different things uh, or just things that you have stuck with you. I often, because I had two younger sisters, my dad would get invited to like some kind of business dinner, one of those rubber chicken things. Um, <laughs> and I would go with him once I hit about 12, 13 as his plus one. <laughs> he just would take me. He's like, well, I've got this seat. Mom doesn't want to go. But what I realize now, and I, it only dawned on me like a year or two ago, that by going to those things at that age, like walking into a room and talking to business people or whoever it was that was the guest of honor at these things, like that kind of a venue for what we do is very common. Mm -hmm. um, and it just reminded me or re made me realize recently that like having been exposed to that at a very young age, like you're kind of more accustomed to being in those settings with people who maybe you have to introduce yourself to or adults that might intimidate you but it gave me that sort of ability to, to speak a little more confidently with strangers or with people you had to interview, maybe in positions of power or influence that, um, that I think a lot of other kids obviously wouldn't have had. Um, and yeah. This is kind of a random experience amid so many others, but one that only recently dawned on me, I was like, you know, if I hadn't been going to those like Chamber of Commerce dinners with dad, it may not have been as easy to you know, get a handle on these kinds. I have a question too. Um, do you uh, guys remember? Do you? And this is asking you to sort of really dig deep. But do you have, do you have a memory of the first time you were aware of your father? Like the first thing that you can remember, as far back as you plumb your memory, yeah. that you say to yourself, "Oh, that's my first memory of." Yeah, that. I have. I have one. My ever since I've been a little like. I don't remember. My dad first worked for the state of Texas as a, um, uh, a state tax assessor for businesses. So he would travel across the state. I was so young, I wouldn't remember him being gone. Well, and I have an older sister. Well, he quit that job because he saw us growing up and he wanted to be around for it. So my parents started their own business and they they have owned a pawn shop for decades 
a mom and pop place. Everybody's so, but it was interesting because we'd show up to the shop and help him close up things and lock things up and clean. Um, and we had, my dad had this blue, it was, we called it the blue car, but it, I think it was a Colt like from the seventies and it was stick and we would race mom home. We're not racing. We're just leaving before her. And he would make it seem like we're hauling in a four cylinder stick car, but we weren't, but it was funny because that was one of my, like, you're right. One of the first earliest memories I have. Of, and I grew up in San Antonio in South Texas in the summer. You know, my dad would have a button up shirt on. Well, he'd take it off uh, and he'd have, he'd have a, you know, the, the white undershirt on cause it's cooler. And, dad in the white undershirt and us racing to get home he's not speeding totally fool my sister and i <laughs> they're both going to speed limit but i swore we were speeding and that's you know my parents are still alive but it's still funny because i always remember like what'd you you know why'd you get rid of that car he's like that car was a piece of junk like i had to get rid of that thing <sighs> for safety reasons but i remember him and i remember the car and i thought they were so awesome scott yeah it, it, i'm it's more granular and more clear to me the things at a very, very young age my dad did with me in my activities or outside the house. The house is almost like white noise in your memory after a while when you're three or four years old. But you do remember him being you know, at the family cookout. You do remember him being at your first you know, t-ball game. You remember him being at church or at, you know, at synagogue that one time where you had you know, the special ceremony. Uh, but let me tell you something else. You all three are going to get this in a minute. I remember the first time my 12 year old didn't want me around anymore because he's, you know, he's too cool for dad. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that moment is going to land with you in a certain way too. And you, you, you prepare for it. You know, it's coming. And yeah. it, it may arrive earlier. Omar, for those who have daughters. Yeah. With um, girls. <laughs> I, I got a little extra time because I got boys, but um, there is certainly like this, there's this, um, this is certain resonance when he comes home and he's not around the social circle and he sees you again. And you see the the little kid again in his eyes, and the warmth, and the and the excitement to be together, and that's almost more enriching and rewarding than the that, that than the feeling you had the first twelve years, where he's always excited to see you. Um, mm -hmm. When 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 he puts his guard down, and he's a little kid again, um, yeah. that moment's going to stick with you just as much as the first giggle, Vlad, or you know, the first laugh and the first step. Uh, what, what do you think? Glad it's funny. As, as I sat here racking my brain a little bit, I did. I did remember it. Uh, there was one that it was. It's a long story, and it was. It was one of those things that dads do wrong, but um, and it's funny. But um, it may not be at SFW. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, nothing. Nothing wrong. But just anyway. Yeah. Um, Facebook. Go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the one I remember is when he taught me how to ride my bike. That yeah. he was holding on to the back of the seat. And, you know, you're going and you know that that feeling is there. And then I was going at one point and I kind of looked or stopped or started to stumble or whatever. And he goes, you had it from back there. And he like pointed back in the parking lot we were in. I was only just running alongside you. And I, and it, and it's, I watched my daughter do it just last summer. And it was the same eureka moment that a kid has. Such a I metaphor really too, isn't it? Now. It's such yeah. a metaphor for fatherhood. It is. It is. It abs that's what I thought too. When I was, I was like, oh, this is what he was doing. And like, but that was it. It was teaching me. It was a red bike. And we'd taken the training wheels off. We went to the church parking lot. And I went and about halfway across the parking lot, apparently I had. And I never, you know, and as they say, you never look back. And I've seen my seven-year-old do it now too. And it's that's definitely the, probably the earliest one. No, well, yeah, I mean, I, like, like that's the that's the um, you know, it, as, as I was saying earlier, I think that even if you have a a short period of time with a parent, uh, in this case a father, um, things will stick with you. Uh, my, I, I have memories of my dad teaching me how to ride a bike. I remember, the, okay, this is the seventies, folks, so things were a little different then. But him putting banana seat bike. Back. Do you have a banana seat? I had a banana seat Schwinn. For sure. was, uh, I, I got stolen at one point, but no, but my father would sometimes sit me on his lap in his car and drive, like forget like putting me in the side seat and making me think we were speeding. 
there's no seatbelt. I'm just in his lap and he's like, oh, put your hands on the steering wheel. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. like this, but he's got his hands underneath it, like steering this way. Would never happen today. Um, yeah. But 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 my very first memory, and and I was able to fact check this with him many many years later was um, we were in our apartment in Queens and my parents uh, loved opera music and they were playing the aria and I'll never forget this because every time I hear this aria I, it makes me think of this day. But um, they, the aria to Madame Butterfly was playing and I happened to look over at our radiator. And there was a dead moth. I, I, there was a dead moth in the radiator. And my dad was sitting at the table and he goes, oh, there goes Madame Butterfly. <laughs> and, and, and that's all I remember. And many, many years later as an adult, I just said to him one day when we were on our rare occasions where we were having a discussion, I said, do you remember this moment? Do you, do you have a memory of that? And he looked at me like I was insane because he, he says, he claims that I was probably not even two years old yet. And what's remarkable is I've kept, I've had that memory yeah. my my entire life, and so th that just got me thinking about the things that we expose our children to, that I hope to expose Celine to, um, that I know if I know myself and others that can have a profound impact, even if it's just a snippet of a memory on who they are and ultimately the kind of person they become. Well, let me ask you guys a question here before I have to take off for um, to catch up to the rest of the crew, but let me. And, th and Vlad, for you, this is something that will happen in the future since Celine's so so tiny. But is there a total dad thing you do <laughs> with with your kids to that you're trying to get them to roll their eyes or even like, oh, dad? Because at first, you mean you on know, purpose? What, you what? On purpose? Yeah, because you know it's going to get a fun ride, like. For mine, when Reese has this song, I will completely sing it loud and off key, like I'm nailing it, and she'll be like, "No, no, Dad," and which is it? And I'm like, "No, it's better. I'm singing it better." And she's like, "Gosh, no, stop!" I tried to find little things like that to get her to <laughs> to react. Um, maybe that's me being a kid myself needling her no oh, we all do it brother we all do it yeah what do you do scott oh i, I threaten to dance <laughs> it's, you don't even have to dance you just gotta threaten to do it take it to the next level threaten to do it around others <laughs> I love that you have like various levels of it's like national yeah, oh, security yeah. levels. It's like this is code green, this is a code yellow. This is <laughs> oh yeah, they're serious. You watch Vlad because you're gonna be like, all right, that's not getting a rise out of them anymore. Got to step it up. You you absolute you I, look listen. I'm, I'm probably gonna get hammered on this because it's Facebook Live. We have a pool, um, and my little one will get in left and right and she'll hey jump in with me and she watched olympic swimming she's like well what are the guys wearing and i was like well those are they're called speedos it's a brand but they wear them for speeding she's like do you have one of those i'm like god no i'm like nobody needs to see that reese <laughs> well my wife looked at me like you're not about to do it and i'm like oh yes i am <laughs> absolutely went and bought one her friends were well, well my oh, wife, no. her, oh, friends my had, her friends had left. Come on, her friends had left. My wife and her were still in the pool, oh, okay. and I went and I they were there, and I had made them dinner. And oh yeah, I'll, here I'll make you guys some to eat. And I quietly changed, and I jumped out, and the, and my daughter was like, "Dad, are you in your under?" Immediately jumped in. The biggest laugh. I thought she was going to swallow water and choke to death in the pool. Have I done it since? Nope. I bought them for one showing, <laughs> but that today it blood is the top that I've done. I don't think I can do it again. No. And I probably won't for the sake of everyone who may have happened to have seen it in the neighborhood. But except the problem, Omar and Scott and Ed, is that what you guys are describing, and Ed, I want to hear yours, but like it sounds like you know what you're doing. The worst thing is when a parent doesn't like either doesn't have a clue that they're doing something to embarrass their children or they don't care. They don't like my parents are immigrants. They believe that children should be seen, not heard. They believe that they're, you know, when I was growing up, there's you have no voice. You have no say in how we do 
anything, like how we decide anything the, from the clothes you wear to like the people that you invite over for your birthday party. And um, I'll never forget like my stepdad, I said, you know, we're having a potluck at school. Everybody's supposed to, you know, parents are supposed to make something. And my dad's like, I got you, no problem. He goes <laughs> out and gets like McDonald's and he brings McDonald's back which I guess is kind of funny because like he had them, he put them in a Tupperware. He put all the Big Macs in a Tupperware as if like these are big, you know, so he was kind of popular. But then my dad is a major foodie, my stepdad. And so he then proceeded to guffaw like four Big Macs, like <laughs> just totally like, oh, my, my, my. what's going on here? Like, and I'm like, oh my God. Even my mother was like, God, he's going to eat his tie. Like if his tie gets in his mouth, it's, it's going to be spattered. But, but here's what you'll realize, Vlad. Here's what you'll realize. Every dad, they, they are aware of it. It's the reaction that they're looking for. Yeah. So your, your stepdad was a thousand percent. He wasn't unaware. It was, he knew what he was doing. And it's that moment that you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to have those with Celine. Because sometimes it may not phase her when she's older, but then other times you'd be like, oh, oh, there it is. There's the vein. I've got to explore this more. And I tell you, we're going to come back and do this in 10 years, and we're going to have what it is that you are doing. But, Ed, what do you do with your girls? See, I'm trying to think. I, I think the most recent attempt at one actually backfired in that they were impressed <laughs> or had fun with it. We were at the supermarket. Okay. And Backstreet Boys came on, and it was one that I remembered from like a middle school dance. And Very so I started seeing it. And my two daughters looked at me like, <laughs> he knows what he's doing. And yeah. they actually started to like sing along and like want to learn the lyrics. Were there moves? Were there dance moves in the I aisle? Feel. It was just I want it that way. But like, <laughs> um, you know, there aren't many moves, but like it was enough that when you're going down the aisle with the with the grocery cart. A little, a little I want it so that I was totally, yes, moves. exactly. And I was yeah. totally expecting them to be like, what are you doing? And they got into it with me. So I was look, like, look at McFarlane. He's like, I know it. Now I see it. Coming. I know it, but I don't <laughs> want to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, you are on the road, obviously, Omar, and you are in the evening news this Friday night. So we have, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts. And then we're going to show folks something that, that Vlad did. And if, I don't know if we have any questions, but you're encouraged to drop Well, uh, my closing thought is have fun. None of us are going to do this perfect. And and I think as dads, we can't beat ourself, ourselves up for that. There's no perfect dad. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to learn. There's literally no manual that is correct on how to be a dad. And as long as we're willing to, you know, like, all right, admit our mistakes and, and, and keep on doing with the good things, I think that is is the best thing we can do, not only for our kids, um, but but for our, our other, our, our sanity. And the one thing I'll add is I like that dads are, it's now becoming cool for dads to start helping each other. Women do a better job of, of that of having mom groups to get together. But I think dad groups are not a bad thing. I mean, I've got some in my neighborhood and I'll, I'll admit, well, you know, we'll meet for a little bit of bourbon or a cold beer on, in the front of the, and talk like how, you know, strategies on, on raising our boys and girls better and keeping, you know, everyone happy in the house. I think that that is something that we can all do as dads to, to get better. Cause the goal is to get better for the kids. Yeah. And with that note, I will see y'all. I've got to keep on driving. Au revoir. Take care. Good luck, Thank you. Happy Father's Day. No, Happy no, Father's no, Day. While, driving. Um, while, we, while we load up some potential questions, uh, Vlad, you um, did something this Friday on CBS Mornings that was quite sweet that we want to show people. Uh, since it is your first Father's Day, why don't you tell us about it and then we'll roll the tape. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, our boss, uh, our bosses at CBS Morning asked me to uh, write a letter to Celine on this, my first Father's Day. And I, 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 it took me a couple of days to agree to the assignment because I just didn't think that I would have anything to impart, having only been a father for just a couple of months. Um, and also, I think in my head, I started to get like, I started to get into my own head about, well, like, you know, I've got a biological dad and a stepdad and it just, it felt like a thorny road to travel. And um, so I let it sit with me for a couple of days. And before I, and then I, as I wrote some of my thoughts out, I then went back to um, the senior producers and I said, okay, I think I, I think I can do this. And, and this is the result. Let's take a look. 
When I was first asked to write a few words about Father's Day as a first time dad, I thought, what do I know? What can I possibly have to say? I've only been a dad for about four and a half months. I'm just learning. It felt like being asked to climb Mount Everest when I was still at base camp, just putting on my boots. But then I realized something. Four and a half months, a little over 19 weeks, which means, Celine, your mom, Mary, and I have been your parents for about 735 hours. I have been your dad for 44,100 minutes. The point is that from the very first minute you came into our lives until this very moment, and even before, I've been your dad, your papa. I was there when you took your first breath, and you were only seconds old when I kissed you and whispered your name into your itty bitty ear. Celine, from the Latin, Calinus, meaning heavenly. You must be missing an angel. And you were just a few hours old when we had our first daddy-daughter dance, fittingly to Heaven Must Be Missing an Angel. Those lyrics. Missing one angel, child, because you're here with me right now. Yes, Celine, in just four months, you've realized that your papa loves music and spends hours singing and playing for you everything from Bach to Springsteen to Coltrane. Sha -la 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 <laughs> and I can tell that you love it too. Especially when I sing your favorite song in Mandarin Chinese. Or at least I try. We read together. Books in English, books in French, and then Mama reads to both of us in Mandarin, so we both learn together. We go on walks to the park and we search for birds and smell the flowers. And sometimes we do nothing at all. And just when I think that my heart is filled to the brim with love and devotion, you go and do something. You grin at me in the morning when I peer into your crib. You grasp at something. You cry and you reach for me. And guess what? My heart grows yet again. But I have learned something on this, my first Father's Day. It's one that I guess all dads and moms too have learned. It can't be taught. You can't prepare for it because the only way to know it is to feel it, to experience it, to live it. The feeling that a heart's capacity for love is infinite, limitless, without end. Dads know what that means. And now, for the very first time, so do I. Uh, it was fantastic. I'll admit I didn't see it live this morning. Um, so I'm glad I saw it now. And um, I think that, that whole point about you, you don't know until you feel it is, is totally true. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, um, it, 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 it just put things in perspective. And I think once you sit with something like that with a thought, and this is why <clears throat> you guys know as journalists, I mean, what makes in my mind, and I'm sure you agree, a good journalist is having good editors, good producers, people who know what you're capable of and um, and what you bring to a story, and in this case, a very personal one. Um, and so I was I was grateful that they gave me this opportunity to write this this letter to Celine because I don't think that I would have thought to do it on my own. Yeah. Um, any other parting thoughts as we wrap up? Really like that, and I really like talking with you guys today. It makes me um, it's 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 it puts a nice perspective on things, and I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, when you you said something about rushing home from saying yes to something too much, and I thought, okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Uh, so I think, as Omar said, it, it doesn't hurt to talk about this stuff. I will because I told my four year old I would show this. She did bring home her Father's Day card. Ah, oh. uh, it is a it is a popsicle for pop get it so uh i love it there's that and and vlad somewhere in this house i can't find it right now we have a gift for celine that we got when we were in guatemala back in the spring oh, so that i owe you um no, so it's, it's, I, we'll it this was this is this was a great gift to be able to spend some time with you i i told um you know my colleagues nate and tony tony de and nate burleson on our show and even john tower who's our 
our audience, they don't, won't know his name, but he's our senior broadcast producer that um, I'm very lucky that, uh, you know, I'm not so, I don't know that I'm looking to be in any dad groups. Um, my wife is trying to get me into some, but because I feel like I already have a lot of great fathers that I work with, you and Scott, you and Omar and Tony and Nate and John and, and, and even before Celine came into the world, I was able to ask them questions. I, I'll never forget Tony said something to me because he's got older kids like that are, you know, in their teens now, his son, Oliver. And he said, you know, um, one of the things that you will realize is that, yes, they are of you and Marion because they have 50 percent of your DNA and 50 percent of hers, but they're their own person. And you should, you, I know you, the inclination is to want them to like the things that you like or be the way that you are. But they, if they are not, that will be okay too. Because that was definitely something that I was thinking. Well, like you saw in that piece, like I love music, so hopefully Celine will love music too. But if she doesn't, I think it was nice to even hear from Tony that that would be okay. And it may seem, um, it may seem self-evident to some people that of course they're not going to be like you want them to be, but I don't think that it, that is. And so I know that I have colleagues like you that I can always rely on. So I don't really need to be any friend group. I can just text you guys yeah. um, and ask you any questions that I have. And being here with you today um, is, is part of that journey. We're, we're lucky in our Washington bureau that there's a handful of us doing this in one way or another, different ages. And it, you're right. It's a good, you just sort of say it or ask and somebody will have an answer or some suggestion. So it's, it's a good thing. Uh, well, look, happy Father's Day to both of you guys and anyone else who's out there who is watching. Uh, we'll have to do this again in some way, maybe in person. And um, thank you for, for joining us and for watching. And we'll see you on uh, we'll see you on CBS, however you watch CBS.